on January 5th, 2012, the following cryptic message was posted in the paranormal section of an infamous internet message board. Hello. We are looking for highly intelligent individuals. To find them, we have devised a test. There is a message hidden in the image. Find it, and it will lead you on the road to finding us. We look forward to meeting the few who will make it all the way through. Good luck. 3301. And so would begin the most complex and maddeningly difficult challenge that the internet had ever seen. While at first, some wrote it off as a clever marketing stunt, over the span of the next 10 years, it would become increasingly clear that it could be no such thing. But what then could it be? Who or what was 3301? Many speculated that the whole thing was a recruiting tool for an intelligence agency like the NSA, the CIA, or MI6. Others believed that perhaps it was a secret society or a cult, but why then the needs for complex skills in steganography, cryptography, mathematics, and so on? What was the purpose? Where did it lead to, and how far would it take those who followed the trail? And to what end? Many would become obsessed with finding out. Where individuals would fail, groups would form, bringing their collective power and expertise to bear on solving the puzzles. But that always runs the risk of one individual in the group going rogue with a discovery. Based on recently leaked information that appears to bear the correct PGP signature, it would appear that at least one person has succeeded in solving the riddle of 3301. But who or what precisely did they find? All that and more today, right here in Dave's Garage. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired software engineer from Microsoft going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days, and today, we're investigating one of the greatest technological mysteries that the world has ever seen, Cicada 3301. It all began with a simple JPEG image posted to the web. It claimed to contain a secret message, but how and where? The file posted that day appeared to be a simple JPEG image, but hidden away within it was plain text, easily extracted from the file with the Unix strings command. When run upon the image, it revealed a message string that contained a reference to Tiberius Claudius Caesar followed by text that had been clearly scrambled by encryption. But what kind of encryption? The reference to Caesar implied that this was likely a simple Caesar cipher, wherein each letter is offset by some number within the alphabet, or in this case, ASCII code. If offset by 3, for example, then A becomes D, B becomes E, and so on. A few iterations of the cipher solver reveals that, sure enough, the 3301 image contains each letter being offset by 4, and once corrected, the result is the URL to an image hosting site. Each step was getting slightly harder, and this trend would continue until the challenges became frustratingly obscure and difficult. And yet, some would persevere, even through the Mayan alphabet, disappearing ink, ancient poetry, and cryptic runes. Loading the linked image into the web browser, we get an image of a duck. More specifically, a decoy duck, and one that openly admits to being a decoy at that. The text on the message reads, look like you can't guess how to get the message out. This is actually our one and only clue, combining guess and out to yield the name of the outguess tool, a program that is able to hide and retrieve information that has been intentionally hidden within an image. By changing a mathematically predictable set of pixels by tiny, subtle amounts, the tool is able to encode data with an image that can't be seen by the naked eye. As a contrived example, let's say we decided to hide text in an image by offsetting the blue value in every 131st pixel up or down by one bit depending on whether we were trying to store a one or a zero. Because we're changing the least significant bit of the color and blue is the least sensitive to the human eye, it's going to be entirely imperceptible in most non-trivial images. The outguess tool applies a number of techniques to extract that hidden data for you automatically. And indeed, Using the outguess tool, we can extract a character string from the duck's decoy image. Here is a book code. To find the book and more information, go to Reddit. Apparently, the next stage of the clue was hidden within the subreddit. Its header contained a numeric code of some kind and a picture of a welcome mat. By applying outguess again, we would receive perhaps the single most important piece of information that 3301 would encode, its public PGP key. A PGP key is a private public key pair. Only the person with the private key can generate messages that will have a signature that matches the public key. Thus, you can send the public key out freely and then anyone at any point can use it to verify that a signed message that you later send out must have been signed with mathematical certainty by whomever possessed the original private key. Put more simply, 
It's a foolproof manner of verifying that a message really did come from a particular sender. And it meant that from this point forward, no one could pretend to be 3301. Only the person truly in possession of the official 3301 private key could send officially signed messages, so it became impossible for anyone else to impersonate 3301. A second image on the subreddit also contained a steganographic image payload that could be extracted without guess. The key has always been right in front of your eyes. This isn't the quest for the Holy Grail. Stop making it more difficult than it is. Good luck, 3301. The subreddit also contained encrypted text messages, which were found to be a veneer cipher where 0 is A, 1 is B, 2 is C, and so on. Decoding the text in the subreddit revealed an ancient English tale by Thomas Bullfinch on King Arthur and his quest for the Holy Grail. The original subreddit message header, when translated from Mayan, is the key to use with the cipher. It's all decoded to a phone number, 214-390-9608. When called, that number played the following message. Very good. You have done well. There are three prime numbers associated with the original final.jpg image. 3301 is one of them. You will have to find the other two. Multiply all three of these numbers together and add a dot com on the end to find the next step. Good luck. Goodbye. Besides pointing out that the group's numeric name was in fact prime in its own right, this message sent investigators on a quick hunt to find two more prime numbers hidden somewhere in the image. A few quickly noted that the height and width of the image, 509 and 503, were also prime numbers. Combined and multiplied with 3301, they would yield the number 845-145-127. With the dot com appended, it led them to a website that contained an image of a cicada and a countdown timer. Without guess applied to the cicada image, the following message was revealed. You have done well to come this far. Patience is a virtue. Check back at 1700 UTC. 3301. Was the image of the cicada important? An interesting fact about cicadas is that while there are over 1500 species, they generally gestate underground for periods of 7, 13, or 17 years. The most popular theory has been that this is to eliminate competition amongst cicadas by reducing the frequency of how often their various gestation periods would overlap with each other. Others have advanced the theory that a prime gestation period would overlap less often with predators that emerged on a 2-year, 3-year, or 4-year cycle, for example. Regardless of what evolutionary pressure led to the prime gestation periods, it's likely that this characteristic, the prime numbers associated with their gestation period, is why 3301 has used cicada imagery. Everyone following the puzzle was now confronted with the same fate, waiting for the countdown timer to expire. It was apparently a way to start the race anew with everyone at the same point. What happened next would solidify 3301's reputation as an international group and largely eliminate the possibility that this was all a ruse created by a single hacker. When the countdown timer reached zero, the image changed. It now contained 14 pairs of GPS coordinates scattered around the globe. California, Australia, Hawaii, South Korea, Poland, and many more. In each of those physical locations could be found a poster in plain view that contained an image of a cicada and a QR code. Shelter over here. So you got a got right there. Oh. And it was taped. You can see the corners. I, as you say, I just kind of ripped it off. It's taped right there. So. The sudden appearance and worldwide distribution of the posters meant that at a minimum, 3301 was a broadly distributed group. Those who believed that 3301 might simply be a few hackers in the basement were now faced with the reality that, at a minimum, 3301 had the resources to make a physical appearance in 14 international locations within a reasonably short time period. But how short? Assuming the posters might last a week or two, they would have had them all been placed within that time limit. A careful analysis of the GPS locations reveals that most of the locations are within about a 90-minute drive of an international airport, but this is true for most urban centers. It also meant that the puzzle was now going off the grid, or at least offline. To continue meant that the solvers would have to venture out into the real world. The QR code on the poster led to an image from which could be extracted a riddle, and taken as a whole, they contained new book ciphers and a curious admonition. You've shared too much to this point. We want the best, not the followers. Thus, the first few there will receive the prize. Good luck, 3301. There was only one problem. 
The book ciphers were plain enough, except the messages never indicated to which books the cipher should be run. The hunt was now on to find the very books which contained the encoded messages. It would take centuries to do so by hand, even in a modest library, but thanks to the power of the internet and modern search, both were found in reasonably short order. The first was found to be Encyclopedia Britannica, 11th edition, volume 6, slice number 3. The second book was even more obscure. Though written by popular author William Gibson, the book Agrippa was only released in a book printed on disappearing ink and on self-erasing 3.5-inch floppy disk in 1992. The book was literally printed on photosensitive paper whose pages, when exposed to light even a single time, would then fade to nothingness. The floppy would entirely encrypt itself after a single use. The result of these puzzles was a link to a page on a website, but it was a Tor link, meaning it was a link to the dark web. The dark web, for lack of a more thorough explanation, is largely encrypted, secret, and unindexed. You don't generally surf it, you go directly to it for a particular page. The reasons for a page's existence in the dark web range from a severe need for privacy to pretty much every illegal activity imaginable. You can't get there accidentally with a regular web browser, in fact. You need special software such as the Tor browser. The Tor link led to a message that read, Congratulations. Please create a new email address with a public, free, web-based service. One you've never used before, and enter it below. We recommend you do this while still using Tor for anonymity. 3301. It further explained where to send the email, but shortly after, the message was replaced with the following. We want the best, not the followers. Those who did so promptly enough received an email that led them to a page that contained an image of artwork. That artwork contained a message with a link that purported to offer latecomers a second chance. It also contained text that encoded another Tor link, which, via a series of prime numbers and other puzzles, ultimately led to an audio file, known as a MIDI file. The musical contents of the audio file seem unimportant, but the MIDI file contents could be laboriously decoded to produce the next message. Very good. You have proven to be most dedicated to come this far to attain enlightenment. Create a GPG key for your email address and upload it to the MIT key servers, and then encrypt the following word list. It also provided a Gmail address to send the encrypted results to. Those who did so properly were provided with an interesting admonition by email. Each person who has come this far has received a unique message encrypted with a unique key. You are not to collaborate. Sharing your message or key will result in not receiving the next step. Those who were selected were also provided with a Tor link, this time to a login page. For the vast majority, as far as we know, this is where the trail went cold. One month later, the following message appeared on a subreddit. We have now found the individuals we sought. Thus, our month-long journey ends. For now. Thank you for your dedication and effort. If you are unable to complete the test, or did not receive an email, do not despair. There will be more opportunities like this one. Thank you all. 3301. A select few, however, received the following explanation. In at least one case, it was leaked to the web, which is how we know of its existence. We are not a hacker group. We do not engage in legal activity, nor do our members. If you are engaged in legal activity, we ask that you cease any and all illegal activities or decline membership at this time. We will not ask questions if you decline. However, if you lie to us, we will find out. You are undoubtedly wondering what it is that we do. We are very much like a think tank in that our primary focus is on researching and developing techniques to aid the ideals we advocate. Liberty. Privacy. Security. Next, it produced three questions to be answered by email. Do you believe that every human being has a right to privacy and anonymity? Do you believe that information should be free? Do you believe that censorship harms humanity? Nothing more was heard from 3301. That is, until precisely one year later, when, on the anniversary of the original image, the next puzzle appeared. Hey, I'm Editor Dave, and that feeling you were just having that I wasn't going to be able to wrap this all up in time? Yeah, you were right. There's just too much cool stuff for a single YouTube episode, so I'm going to split it right here. Make sure you're subbed for part two. Now, I don't have any Patreons, and I'm not selling anything. I'm just in this for the subs and likes, and I would indeed be honored if you'd consider subscribing to my channel so that you get a chance to see what's coming up in part two, as well as other cool episodes like Why Are Blue Screens Blue and programming info on things such as the fire LEDs behind me here. 
Leave your feedback in the comments, which I do try to read daily. And if you'd like to chat with me and the other subscribers, check out the Discord link in the video description. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. And by the way, what follows is an homage to a show called The Friendly Giant that I grew up with in Canada, but is actually done by a guy who started it, I believe, in Minnesota. So if you want to Google it, it's The Friendly Giant. That's for the Americans. The Canadians already know what this is. Good day. Oh, I'm not saying it. See ya. This little chair will be waiting for one of you, and a rocking chair for another who likes to rock, and a big armchair for two to curl up in. All next time on Dave's Garage. Are you subscribed yet?